Welcome back to another episode of Dynasty Decisions. This is number 111, where we go through your Dynasty teams, your questions. We got rookie drafts fast approaching, less than two weeks away from the NFL draft. Should be a fun one, so let's not waste any time. Let's get into it. All right, so to kick things off, we have the first team on the docket from Flett, of course, a Mother Flocker tier subscriber over on Flock Fantasy. And of course, if you do want to get your team broken down ASAP, especially once we get to the post-draft cycle, I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to have a lot of rookie draft questions. The quickest and easiest way to do that is by signing up on Flock Fantasy using the promo code FSE. The first team, like I said, we have here is from Flett, 12 team, half PPR, four point per passing touchdown, half tight end premium. Uh, Justin Herbert, Bryce Young as the main quarterbacks in the super flex format. J.K. Dobbins really is the only running back. Chase Brown, Roshan Johnson, C.D. Lamb, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jalen Waddell as the main wide receivers. And then Trey McBride and Michael Mayer as the main tight ends with the 102, the 202, 208, 302, 402, and then an extra one in 2025. So he said he's likely going to stick and take Marvin Harrison Jr. at 102, given the roster construction. It's three startable wide receivers. I will say, I mean, knowing that you have a super flex spot, Drake May, if he goes to the Minnesota Vikings or something, would definitely factor in at that pick. He said he's explored options of keeping a stronger QB2 through trade or through the draft, but it doesn't seem likely given the you know state of his team. He's not really ready yep. to compete with the running back core that he has. He said, should I keep hammering wide receivers this year? Plan is to be bad again next year and use draft capital to build the running back room. So to me, that sounds like a sound strategy. I don't know about yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much exactly how I would play this. Uh, fun context here. I'm actually in this league, so I know the inner workings uh, of it. I believe this is the SDM v. Newman Dynasty League. And as you'll see, one of the trades ended up aging very well for Mr. Flett here, uh, especially with that CD Lamb piece he was able to get. But all jokes aside, the way I'm playing this, I think you pretty much nailed it. 102, pending if Caleb's there, pending if Marvin Harrison's there. Most likely going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. He would be my pick at that second slot. Maybe if, you know, you see a running back profile you like at the 202, you can add maybe one. But I agree with your assessment here that if you just pound wide receivers, you get as much value you can out of this rookie draft. And obviously next year with the advantageous running back class coming in in 2025, that's when I would then be shelling out at my running back position. Because, I mean, by then you'll know exactly what Bryce Young is. Is Bryce Young taking the step? If Bryce Young is a player that you have to move off of, you'll have a lot more context going into year three Bryce Young versus what we know now going into year two, Bryce Young. So just play it by ear. Again, you're not pressed to accumulate as much points as possible, and you've done a good job collecting a lot of uh, assets on this team. And there's a big reason why if we look at this next deal. Yeah, absolutely. I, just quickly speaking on the team one more time, it's nice when you can set up a rebuild in the strength of the classes that you're rebuilding into. Like this class, very strong at wide receiver, good depth at quarterback too. It's possible that you could get your quarterback three there at the 202 if you wanted to sh uh, take a shot on an early second round pick, Bo Nix or Michael Penix at that point. Maybe one of the, uh, like if they go in the first round, maybe they would slide to that point or you can move up a little bit to get one of those guys. But again, when you're rebuilding, you ideally, the reason that you research future classes is that so you know, you know, Flett's aware that the 2025 running back class is going to be strong. So he can fill out his wide receiver core in the 2024 class. He's already set at tight end. He already has one set quarterback, hopefully upside for another set quarterback. So this year, you just hammer out wide receivers, maybe take a detour for a quarterback or a running back if you need to with that 202, 208, 302, whatever you want to do. But then, yeah, in 2025, you fill out your running back core, especially your pick's probably going to be early. You get another mid first in 2025. So definitely like how you've built this thing so far. Like you said, the trade that he ended up making here, uh, Deshaun Watson and Kenneth Walker were sent away in exchange for CeeDee Lamb, Kadarius Tony, a 2023 second, which became Roshan Johnson, a 2024 208, um, which obviously has this year, and then a mid to late first in 2025. So I mean, even if that was a late first, this is a great trade because as of right now, this isn't even enough for C.D. Lamb on his own. Uh, probably a first on the Watson side short uh, of C.D. Lamb on his own. So the fact that you got a one, two twos and Kadarius Tony on top of C.D. Lamb is definitely elite. 
And it's so funny because I remember when he initially made this trade, I'm pretty sure he sent this team in for DD. And this is about the time where this is deemed fair market value. Deshaun Watson and CD Lamb were going similar points in startups at the beginning of the second round. Kenneth Walker, you could have made the case for, uh, was worth a one and two in his own right. So at that time, it's basically, you know, about even market value deal. And obviously the way it's kind of, you know, uh, appreciated at this point for you. You're, you're pretty much laughing because CD Lamb, like you said, somebody offered me Deshaun Watson, Kenneth Walker for CD Lamb straight up. I'm probably not negotiating with that guy ever again. Yeah, no, exactly. So absolutely great trading that you've done so far. Hopefully this year you can make some more moves, maybe trade down from uh, your 202 or your 208, maybe punt to future classes, whatever you yeah. need to do. Your wide receiver core for what it's worth. Once you add Harrison to this team, could be in pretty decent shape. Let's say you add Harrison at 102, you add Troy Franklin or Xavier Leggett at 202 or something like that, and somebody wants to give you their 2025 20, second for your 208, like you can absolutely make moves like that and punt into future classes, especially knowing that your team is a couple years away still at this point in time. You need to add a running back core, probably a third quarterback before you're ready to compete. Yeah. But the nice thing is that you do have a lot of stud talents on this roster already. You have a positional advantage at quarterback, a positional advantage at tight end, positional mm -hmm. advantage at wide receiver once you add Marvin Harrison to this team. So you're in a pretty good spot. I think we could probably move on to the next team here, which is from Zach T, 12-team PPR, four-point for passing touchdown, uh, super flex league as well. Justin Herbert, Jalen Hurts, Bryce Young, Derek Carr, Sam Darnold, very well-built quarterback core there. Yep. Kenneth Walker, Javante Williams, Kendra Miller, Devin Singletary, Chuba Hubbard, a lot of like zero RB guys there at running back. Chris Olave, Michael Pittman Jr., Jalen Waddle, Nico Collins, Devo Samuel, Christian Kirk, Amari Cooper. Very strong all around so far. Kyle Pitts, yep. Michael Mayer as the top uh, tight ends. Doesn't have his picks this year, next year. Doesn't really pick until 2026. So you're, you're kind of all in with this team. The one thing I, I kind of worry about with this roster is it's lacking some real difference makers. Like when you look at the redraft landscape of where some of these guys are being selected in a super flex league, I mean, Hertz and Herbert are obviously going to be selected very high in a super flex redraft, but the rest of your roster, your running back core is kind of like destined to be back end RB one, mid RB twos at the best case scenario, your wide receiver core, more back end wide receiver one, mid wide receiver twos at the best case scenario. Now, if you're trying to win with depth here, having a bunch of good options on, uh, you know, across all of Start your 10. positions, you can do that, but it's hard to do if there's any studs, if there's any monsters in your league. Yeah, I would agree. You kind of left you in a, yourself in a tough spot there. Uh, he says with the team clearly trying to contend for the next couple of years. Yeah, that's absolutely going to be your goal. But like Corey said, the problem is you would need a very optimistic season from a, a, an Alave or maybe Jayla Waddle to get back to his form from a couple years ago, or maybe Nico Collins to catch, you know, 13 to 15 touchdowns from CJ Stroud this year, or maybe Christian Kirk to be the wide receiver one for the Jaguars, be a top 15 receiver. Like you need at least one or two like instances of somebody overperforming expectations, in my opinion, to make up for the stud difference. Like Corey mentioned, it is a start 10 league. So uh, this is still a type of format where, you know, you're 24, Point per game, your 22 PPR point per game, CD Lamb, Tyree Kill, Jamar Chase type of difference makers absolutely matter. So it's going to be tougher. Obviously, uh, you're trying to get over the hump. That's the main reason why you asked the question. You're asking also, uh, with the depth that I have, should I try to liquidate into future picks? It really depends on how the team is showing out in these first couple of weeks. If you start the season and you're five and one and you're, you know, second or third in points per game or points per game, right? And you're putting up points on a weekly basis at that point. Maybe I don't liquidate because I really do feel like there's a really strong winning window. However, if your team is, you know, maybe the fourth or fifth best team in your league and you realize, hey, like Amari Cooper is just sitting away on my depth right now and I'm not really making a winning difference. See, maybe if you can add, you know, Amari Cooper plus another piece, uh, piece try to get some liquidity back. Not necessarily sure what type of league market you're operating in. If it's more of a win now type of market, I mean, if you plug in Amari Cooper plus another piece, can you potentially get somebody's late projected 2025 one? That's the, about the move that I would be trying to make. Yeah, I think the thing that stands out to me with this team is that you have a lot of like guys that are in their prime. So one thing that I might consider doing is knowing that you don't have your 2024 or 2025 picks, I might have to eat some older players for better production. So if you yeah. could sell Chris Olave hypothetically for Tyreek Hill, I would probably do that in your situation. If you could sell 
Jalen Waddle for a, you know, older wide receiver who's more productive than Jalen Waddle, who projects better from like a redraft standpoint, you could maybe do that. Now, I wouldn't go crazy with it. I wouldn't sell every young yeah. player you have for a bunch of good old productive players, but like a, a transition here and there, like an Alave to Hill transition makes some sense if the Tyreek Hill manager is looking to rebuild, for example, or maybe... Nico call or maybe not Nico Collins because he's young and productive, but a Debo Samuel type. If you can transition him into a better redraft projection, like say you get Mike Evans and a third for him or something like that, that might make a little bit of sense there. So again, I would look at your team and we never really want to do this, but look at your team because you're in a winning window with no future picks in the next two classes. Look at it from a bit of more of a redraft lens than we typically do from a dynasty perspective and think about how you can improve your bottom line projection this season. And if you can do that, maybe Javante Williams, you can sell for a more productive, older running back, or maybe Kenneth Walker, you can sell for a more productive, older running back that could give you really good production in 2024 and 2025. Because the reality is your team is probably going to need to rebuild after the next few years anyway. So you might as well go all in and not half-ass this contending window that you're in. Yeah, no, I agree with that analysis there. He also mentions, uh, uh, he already ob obviously, like I said, mentioned the draft capital. It's nice having, you know, Kirk and Cooper off the bench when I'm contending. He did say, I'm sure I'll get some offers midseason if Bryce Young plays well, which would be the top of the list to cash out on. So basically what he's saying is, obviously with Justin Herbert, you know, Jalen Hurts at the helm, if Bryce Young, let's just say, starts the first six weeks of the year, he's the quarterback 11 in fantasy, and he looks miles better than he did in year one. At that point, you have to know his market because typically speaking, if he does take that type of leap in year two, we're probably talking a guy that's going in the first two rounds of a startup. I mean, we saw just how fast it was with Jordan Love. It could very well be that case for a guy like Bryce Young. So what I would advise you is if you're going to move Bryce Young in season, make sure you're projecting forward what his startup value will be because you might see it and think, oh my God, like this guy was worth, you know, a seventh round startup pick in my league just two months ago, but now somebody's willing to offer me like insert wide receiver two projection or insert art like back in RB1 projection here in exchange for Bryce Young. Like if somebody offered you, I don't know, straight up Saquon Barkley for Bryce Young after Bryce Young started hot, make sure you know that projecting forward, Bryce Young would be more valuable than the asset. So you have to make sure that's part of your analysis here. Obviously, the tantalizing production for some of these guys are going to be high end, but knowing that you're not selling short on Bryce Young if he does take that leap has to be in your prerogative. Yeah, and it also might behoove you to try and move him now even too and offload that risk. If Bryce Young plus Chris Olave can get you up to one of the stud receivers that'll actually make a difference in your lineup, that might be something that a rebuilding team that say has Jamar Chase on their roster might be willing to do because they want a shot at a young quarterback and a young receiver back like Chris Olave. So again, you have some flexibility because you have a lot of good assets here, but if you can consolidate some of your depth, especially a wide receiver into better point producers week over week at wide receiver that would probably make a lot of sense for you so again he said he's going to get some offers midseason he said he wasn't sure if he could get a quarterback at the 105 so he figured he'd engage the guy looking to trade Jalen Hurts and he ended up getting Nico before the uh the Stefan Diggs trade but he still feels good about Nico again I I do as well yeah um, along with Debo so some of the trades that he made here you guys can see on uh, March 5th, 2024, he sold the 109 and received Nico Collins. Again, I still think he's worth about that, maybe yeah. even more than that. So probably more than that. So I probably wouldn't fret too much that, you know, Stefan Diggs is now on the Texans. I still think Nico is the winner in that trade. 105, a 2025 first, which projects to be late. I'm assuming it's his. And Jaden Reed in exchange for Jalen Hurts. That is like absolutely stealing Jalen Hurts. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. You definitely should have made that trade. Yeah. And Start then 108 for Michael that. Pittman Jr., I'm that one's that. like, I think that's fair. Like, I think that's what Pittman is worth. The problem with that trade is that he's not enough of a point producing difference maker to the point that like, I would have rather taken 108 plus Amari Cooper and gotten a better receiver than Michael Pittman Jr. Yeah. Yeah. The way I kind of see it is uh, the asset of the 108 offers much more flexibility at this point than, than Michael Pittman. Because like I said, we kind of know what Michael Pittman is. And I mean, we're also talking about the fact that Yes, he's the number one on the Annapolis Colts, but hypothetically, he's still volatile from a value standpoint. He's an older receiver now at this point. I believe, what, 1998 birthday. So we're talking about a guy that is 26. He's older than that. He's a 96. He's 97. 
97. 97. Yeah, he's like 26, 27 so, years old. But the point remains, right? He's a 27-year-old receiver, and he's still at risk, man. Like, what if at 15th overall, the Indianapolis Colts select Brian Thomas? Like, his value could be cut, not necessarily from a projection standpoint, but from a market value standpoint. So I just, the aspect of buying Michael Pittman now for an asset like 108, knowing that that's inherently going to gain value, whereas there's risk that Michael Pittman loses value, I wouldn't have made that move. You made it April 1st. So I, I, I'm pretty sure you're probably looking at your lineup saying, hey, listen, like I don't need these rookie picks. I need a vet projection because this team has to be win now. So you rush this move. I definitely would not have done that at the time you did. Uh, for sure. I think That's all of these moves, aside from the Hurts deal, to be honest, and I guess the Nico Collins yeah. deal as well, because he might have had a window where he was going to gain value. Like the I would take Nico over Michael Pittman. The 105 and the first that you sold next year. Like you probably could have gotten more for them had you waited. Again, the Hurts deal I'm fine with because I think you just got a great deal on Jalen Hurts. But Nico Collins and Pittman specifically, like you might have gotten better receivers for that 109 and 108 once your league mates clued into the rookie draft scene and how yeah. good this class is and all that kind of stuff. And they start envisioning, you know, the the Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver one with that 108 like, or 109 or the Buffalo Bills wide receiver one. Um, or JJ McCarthy on the Vikings or whatever, like you probably could have gotten a better receiver in exchange for, for these, these picks potentially. Like, I think you probably could have gotten like Brandon Ayuk if you had waited it out. Yeah. Well, you might've been able to get up to Tyreek too. Cause, and Tyreek yeah. fits your build because you're trying to win now, obviously. So again, this kind of felt like, Oh, I'm, I'm close to winning. How do I fill up my starting lineup in April? And it's like, that's not what you want to do with these rookie picks, especially knowing that they're probably going to gain value a month from now when we're actually on the clock in rookie draft. So again, your team is good. Depending on your league market, if there's no monsters, you could definitely win with this team. If there is monsters yeah. though, then I would have a hard time beating those guys in the finals, in the, in the uh, playoffs when it really counts because your team, while a lot of depth and it's a start 10, so depth kind of matters. It's a PPR you're probably going to lose to a team that say has like Jamar chase and like a bunch of other high end assets that uh, can really give you point production week over week because you're kind of just solid across the board. You don't have an elite difference maker really at any other position aside from quarterback. And those guys can carry you, but at the same time, I'm a little bit worried about that. So the next team that we're going to look at here is from Arthur F a 10 team PPR half tight end premium four point per passing touchdown, one quarterback league. So you have Kyler Murray, Jordan love, Daniel Jones. Those guys are good enough for you at quarterback. Pollard, Eckler, Montgomery, Singletary, Zach Moss, Samir White, those type of guys, Jalen Warren at running back. So very zero RB kind of core there. Tyree Kill, Stefan Diggs, DJ Moore, DK Metcalf, Mike Williams, DeAndre Hopkins, Brandon Cooks, Michael Gallup, uh, Mark Andrews, Jake Ferguson, Noah Gray, 107, 109, 408 there in the rookie draft and then all of your picks in 2025. So this team's in a little bit better shape as far as a contending window is concerned because he has yeah. all of his picks and he actually has an extra one this year in 2024, even though he doesn't have his second and his third. And you do have difference makers at certain positions, right? You have, I mean, at quarterback, it's a one quarterback league, so it doesn't really matter as much, but at wide receiver and tight end, you have difference makers with Tyree kill with Mark Andrews, yeah. with, you know, DJ Moore and DK Metcalf and those type of guys. So this is a situation where I look at this team. It's a start 10, one quarterback league. And I think you're, you're probably among the best in your league across the board at every position besides running back. And you have adequate RB two caliber projections or better from a redraft standpoint to be able to carry the rest of your team into the, into the finals and into the playoffs. So uh, Arthur basically says, thanks for everything we do. I was the number one seed last year, but lost after the buy. I feel like I should run it back and try and compete again. What should I do at eight? He says as well, I guess at seven and nine is what the picks that he has after the trades that he ended up making. But he also does have eight by the looks of it because he made a trade in November for it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this yep. team? And then we'll try and parse through what he actually has in terms of rookie picks. Yeah, I'm just going to go about it like he meant to say nine because uh, it like realistically it doesn't show that he has this pick. And he also gave like I, I don't know. Maybe he meant to write in not, uh, eight for nine. Who knows? But regardless, the other thing I'm looking at potentially I don't know what type of league market you're operating in, but if you could potentially get a Barkley or a Jacobs for one of those picks in a one quarterback start 10 league, knowing how much firepower you have a receiver, knowing that you have an advantage at tight end, knowing that you have numbers at running back, but no clear anchor, in my opinion, from a projectable standpoint, I'd be willing to buy in on a bell cow running back. Yeah, I mean, he sold Rashad White midseason, but I think that was probably a good process. You got the 108 for him. For sure. Like, hell, maybe, you, maybe you're able to use the 108 right now or the 107 or the 109, whatever picks you end up having. Let's just assume you have two late first rounders in this 10-team start, uh, start 10, one quarterback league. If you can use one of those picks to go buy Barkley, or maybe you can get up to ETN, or maybe you can add a piece to get up to Jonathan Taylor, Devon Achan, or somebody like that, 
that's definitely something I would explore doing because the rest of your team is in pretty good shape. I mean, worst case scenario, you can always just sit there and pick one of these top wide receiver prospects, add some youth to your core because you do actually kind of need a little bit of depth to it as well. So if you sit you there do. at 107, 108, 109, whatever picks you end up having, and you have an Xavier Worthy on the board, you have a Brian Thomas Jr. on the board, you have um, Lad McConkey on the board, you can definitely make some picks in that area of the draft to help fill out your wide receiver core. But like you said, if you do have multiple firsts this year in 2024, I think selling one of them for a difference making Jacobs, Saquon Barkley, maybe an ETN or a Taylor makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I think that's a good point on the depth too, knowing it's three wide receivers, three flexes, uh, I believe. Yeah, full PPR league. So uh, that depth will matter. And technically speaking, you'd probably want to be, you know, seven, eight deep. You would want to fill at least one through the flex. And I would say, I mean, unless you're the most optimistic Brandon Cooks guy in existence, I would say you're probably about six deep, even five, knowing that Mike Williams is coming off the ACL. So definitely, like Corey said, if you can keep one of the picks, attack a young receiver to replenish some depth, and then use the other one, like I mentioned, to go buy a hammer running back, uh, I'd be willing to do that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, looking at this team, it, it seems pretty straightforward to me the direction that you're going in. It's like if yeah. you can spend your picks to further your winning window by selling them, you know, around the rookie draft in May when they have the most value, you could definitely do that. But worst case scenario, you could always spend those picks. And I mean, looking at some of the trades that he ended up making, he sent away Kyle Pitts in a first. I don't know when that first was. I don't know where it was projected. Maybe it was one of the guys that he had already. He got Metcalf, Moss, and Ferguson. Again, this was um, September 25th. So you're kind of buying really high on Zach Moss, unfortunately. And then Metcalf and Ferguson. I mean, Metcalf and Ferguson are fine assets, but Pitts and a first for those guys, that's definitely a, a tough price to pay because Pitts is worth more now than he was then. And also, I don't know where that first ended up becoming. If it was a late first, hopefully, um, then it's not as bad. But if that became an, a mid or an early first, that's definitely not ideal. Yeah, that one is tough. I'm not going to lie. Um, this next deal, though, I, like we kind of went through, it's probably about equivalent market value. It just it, it feels weird because the sequence of these deals, I guess, like the the November one happened uh, like a couple months after. Is that November? Yeah, that's November. Uh, the November one happened obviously a couple months after. Uh, so the two moves I see here with the pits in the 2024 first for Metcalf, Moss, and Ferguson, and then the Peterson in the two-way for Eckler would indicate that you're trying to contend. But then this 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 move a couple months later ends up signifying that you're giving up contending assets. So I'm kind of thinking like maybe you went into the season, you wanted to be the top contender. Uh, somebody, maybe it was, you know, Kyler coming back from injury, love not giving you quarterback points at the start of the year. Pollard obviously being a disappointment, you know, Eckler kind of being disappointed at that. Like maybe your team was just disappointing, especially after Mike Williams tore his ACL that you decided to sell. But I will say that the, the contending moves that you made at the time, I just don't really agree with for the most part, especially knowing at the time that Damian Pierce was about equivalent value to Eckler. Now it obviously aged fine for you, but if you could have moved Damian Pierce at that time for liquidity or just a different running back period, like if you could have used him to leverage up to a top end Taylor when he was holding out, I would have rather went that part, uh, that path than just buying in on Eckler at the time that you did. Yeah, I think, I mean, the pro learning from the Zach Moss trade is one thing that like when you have a spike week King like Zach Moss, who was at the beginning of the season kind of on the rise, you probably should be looking to sell assets like that, not buy them. Like yeah. you should be looking to buy on assets. Like you said, like a Jonathan Taylor, somebody that's a stud asset that we know will maintain some liquidity. Whereas Moss was like the second he wasn't producing, he wasn't going to be valuable anymore. And even then we were all kind of skeptical that he was going to keep doing what he was doing. He had a good season in the end, but at the same time, you probably don't want to buy high on players like that. So that's kind of just a learning experience. I, I don't really fault the Damian Pierce for Eckler trade too much because at the time, I think Eckler had a good bounce back case in, you know, mid RB1 type of value the rest I mean, of the year. I actually don't mind that trade at all at the time. Uh, in terms of market value, you don't think Pierce was at least valued with Eckler, if not higher at the time he made the I was deal more concerned about Pierce at the time than I was about Eckler because Eckler was just banged up Fair. and he was going to potentially get back on the field and be an RB1, whereas Pierce was like legit bad. Fair, fair, fair. But I, I, I just remember coming into the year how 
hype that some people were on Damian Pierce, I think you probably could have gotten more at the time. Still, but he was like a dead zone running back versus a first round pick, like in terms of a redraft sure. pers- uh, perspective. And he was a contending team and he, you know, obviously lost Fair. after the, uh, the buy that he had. So to me, again, I don't, I don't fault you too much for that deal. I think going forward, like we said, the main advice that we would have for you is maybe try and get a hammer running back around the time of the rookie draft when those picks have the most value, if you can, worst case scenario, you fill out your wide receiver core. I think you could still win. Like if you add, say Lad McConkey and Xavier Worthy to this team and, you know, build out your wide receiver core a little bit more and you go into the season with this exact roster and you swap out every week between Pollard, Eckler, uh, Montgomery, maybe Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, or Zamir White get into your lineup. Like I'm totally fine just rolling as a zero RB team with a stud wide receiver core and a stud tight end and a stud quarterback between Jordan Love and Kyler Murray. So to me, I think you're probably in a good spot, generally speaking. Um, We can move on to the next team here, which is from Nick Porter, a 12 team, full PPR, six point per passing touchdown, super flex league. Justin Herbert, Jordan Love is the top quarterbacks. Definitely a great duo there. Devon Achan is the main running back. Not a whole lot going on behind him. Nico Collins, Drake London, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Josh Downs, Jamison Williams and others at wide receiver. Kyle Pitts and Michael Mayer at tight end is in possession of the 101, the 109, 201, 203, 301, 304, 310, and then all of his future picks. So he said he's honestly unsure of the direction to take his team into. So that's a good, you know, starting point for us to talk about. He said he feels like he's another elite or stud running back and a good wide receiver away from actually competing with this team. This is kind of like if you bumped everybody down minus the quarterbacks, one position, like if you dropped Jameer Gibbs at the running back position, um, Jamar Chase at the wide receiver position, tight ends probably fine, but another good wide receiver at the top. You're kind of just lacking that stud factor across the board at your flex positions. Yes, and I got to get into this trade because you do mention that you probably think you overpaid. I'm not even the Trevor Lawrence guy. I'll let you take it away in a second, but Trevor Lawrence in the 103 for Herbert in the 203, man. Like I prefer Herbert to Lawrence, and I do think that there is a good gap. But knowing that the 103 is valued currently as a mid second round startup asset, you basically gave away like Lawrence is about, let's say, you know, an early to mid second rounder in most startups. That 103 is going to be a mid second round asset. And Herbert's going between the 108 and the 111 anyway. So you basically played two mid second round startup picks for like the 108 in a startup. And where does the 203 go? Maybe like the ninth round. Yeah. I mean, if you're a risk averse dynasty player, this is not as bad of a trade because you got the best <laughs> asset in the deal. But at the same time, dude, I'm a big Lawrence guy. And like to start me, I would take Lawrence man, in the 103. Even if Malik you even if you only got the 110 back or something, I would still take Lawrence in the 13. Yeah, like this would make more sense to me if you were worried about Trevor Lawrence and you said, Hey, listen, I'm giving up uh Lawrence plus the 103 for Herbert plus the 106. Because then at that point, it's like, okay, you know what? I would prefer Malik to Odunze, but I would also prefer to Her- a Herbert to, to Trevor Lawrence. And the difference, uh, Malik goes at the end of the second round, Romo Dunze in the mid-fourth round is a bigger gap of a pick difference than, you know, Trevor Lawrence to Justin Herbert. Like, I think that's a more plausible deal. It's just the 203 is not a good enough asset to get back in this type of deal, especially knowing that it's a start nine where the 203 is going to be inherently uh, less value comparatively to like a start 12 type of league. Uh, that 103, man, like we're looking at Malik Neighbors, and you just mentioned like if he had a couple more studs on this team, if you added Marvin Harrison Jr. slash whatever asset the 101 pick gave you, whether you could have traded that for one of the top three receivers or whether you just stuck and pick Marv, and then also added Malik Neighbors to that receiver core, you would have been rocking Trevor Lawrence, Jordan Love, Devon A. as your main running back with the 109 plus the 201 plus the 203 to attack maybe a couple more in this class. And then you would have had Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, plus all those good receivers you already have. So I just think it's a rush deal. And again, I am as big of a Justin Herbert guy there is, but Lawrence plus the 103 is too steep. Like if you really wanted to pay for Herbert, Lawrence plus the 109 is probably about the route I would go. Yeah, I, I think I look at this, I look at this team and I, I see a dynasty player that probably got nervous on Trevor Lawrence for starters, I would imagine. And also didn't trust their own drafting ability to be able to get a great player at 103. And again, you don't really have to be a smart dynasty player to pick a good player in this class at 103. They're all very good prospects in that area of the draft. 
again, when you're a rebuilding team, you unfortunately do not have the luxury of overpaying for a stud quarterback. Like, again, you can do it when the opportunity presents itself and it's the right price. But generally speaking, your goal should be the pick capital that you accumulate to hit on those picks. If you had 101, 103, 109, 201, 203, all these picks, and you're a, a dynasty player who's rebuilding, again, that's why rebuilding is for smarter dynasty players, not smart dynasty players, experienced dynasty players that can hit on their picks and trust their own ability to draft. You probably shouldn't rebuild a team if you have the attitude that, you know, the second I get some pick liquidity, I'm going to cash it in for veterans. It's like, that's a hasty move. You kind of want to try and hit on those picks. Again, buy your veterans where you can if the value presents itself. But generally speaking, you're spending your picks, not cashing them out. And I love Justin Herbert, but if you had made this deal, Trevor Lawrence 103 for 203 plus insert Lamar Jackson, you know, Josh Allen, CJ Stroud, like Patrick Mahomes, that makes more sense. And I would still prefer the Lawrence side there. It's just knowing the market is also going down on Justin Herbert right now to the point where would you be at all shocked in some startups if the difference in pick between Trevor Lawrence and Justin Herbert was within four picks? The difference in quarterback ranking in my rankings is two spots. They're like, they're bigger. It's bigger for me. But like I'm saying, like the market, I feel like is getting lower and lower on Herbert. Yeah. And if the Jags add a receiver, like Lawrence's value is going to go higher. Yeah, especially if the Chargers don't. If they if yeah. they draft like a tackle at at five or whatever. Yeah, that definitely could happen. Again, I'm not going to kill you too hard for buying an elite quarterback. I just think, Agreed. given the state of your team, it's not the time to be buying an elite quarterback. Again, it's six point for passing touchdowns. So Herbert's got a lot of value and all that stuff. I love but, Herbert. Again, I uh, I probably wouldn't have done that. 101, 109, I mean, I would love to just say this is a team where you have to take Marvin 101, but dude, in a six-point per passing touchdown, you have to take Caleb, man. You have to take Caleb Williams with this pick. So if you don't want Caleb Williams because you already have Justin Herbert and Jordan Love, you got to trade down. Well, and that's the other thing. Like, you had the 101. If you wanted to trade Trevor Lawrence, like, why not trade him for, like, the 102 or like trade him plus a little piece for the 102 even if all he nets you is the trade. 105 and a 25 second or whatever you get Malik neighbors out of Trevor Lawrence and pocket a 25 second you just take Caleb Williams at 101 yeah like I I just don't understand the process because you said uh, at the okay this is what he said uh in the long run I think Herbert has a higher ceiling and at the time I traded it yes 103 hurts but I wasn't quite into the rookie class it's like that's not the mindset you have. It doesn't matter if you're into the rookie class at Everybody all. Everybody else People is. So that's that's the that's the that, that's a flawed thing. Like again, if you're not into the rookie class, that's fine. You sell your rookie picks, but you wait until their peak value to do so. Yeah, yeah. I just think this was very rushed. And again, like does it like this is the one thing I noticed from like a lot of newer dynasty players is they'll say, well, because I don't like this asset, means I have to devalue him on the market. It's like, well, no. If you know he's valued higher than you do on the market sell them for the market value. Why would you sell them for your cost? Cause then at that point, if you're just, if you're selling them for what you value him for, and it's less than the market you're dealing with, why not just keep them if that's how you value him? And you know that none of your league mates are at that value. Yeah, no, like the, there's no such thing as a universal dynasty sell across every single league because every league is going to value players differently. You're going to value players differently. You're going to value assets differently. A player, I can make dynasty sells and dynasty buys video until I'm blue in the face. But if that player has so much value in your league to the point that they're not a buy, then they're not a buy in your league. Like that's why I, you guys as watching these videos yeah. have to kind of um, take into context what we're saying, the general dynasty market, and then apply it to your own league and kind of um, make decisions at that point in time. Yeah, like if I say, for example, I don't know, uh, DeMario Douglas is the biggest buy in dynasty right now, but you're in a, a league in Boston and you're a bunch of Pats fans and they value him as a top 35 wide receiver in dynasty. He's no longer a buy, even though a I sell. made a video explicitly saying to buy him. It all depends on the market you're working from. Yeah, exactly. So I think we've hammered Nick's team enough. Again, not the greatest trade, but I do think you're in a Good great team spot still. here. Again, yes. you know, pick what you need to pick here in the draft. Uh, maybe consider moving off of that 101. See if the 102 manager needs a quarterback. Whatever the case is, to me, I I'm just picking Caleb. Um, at that point in time, I know you need Marvin more, but I would probably still pick Caleb at 101. And then you could also sell that pick for a, a stud wide receiver like Jefferson, who's maybe on the low right now, a stud wide receiver. Lamb, maybe you can Chase. get a Monra plus for the 101 or something like that. Um, definitely something I would consider. So we could probably move on here to the next team, which is from Seth. 
12 team PPR, six point per passing touchdown, half tight end premium, super flex, Lamar Jackson, Brock Purdy, Aaron Rodgers, Jameer Gibbs, Joe Mixon, and others, Jalen Waddell, Amari Cooper, Terry McLaurin, DeAndre Hopkins, and others there. Mark Andrews, Hayden Hurst, and others there. 109, 111, 202, 306, 410. So this is the type of team. Um, he said this is the first year of his first dynasty league. He's looking for advice on what type of team he has. He knows he's pretty shallow and old at wide receiver, but he should be able to fill some of that need in the rookie draft with that 109 and 111 pick. You're going to be right in the center of that tier two of wide receivers there. And he said any moves that we would make ahead of the draft, or should he just kind of stick and pick? Any advice helps. So yeah, you're definitely shallow at, at pretty much yeah. every position. I mean, yeah. quarterback, you're probably fine, but at um, tight end, you have nobody. I like the like framework if Andrews were to miss any games, you have nothing there. And yeah. then at running back, you have Gibbs and Mixon and nothing else. And then at wide receiver, in a start, what is this, six start wide, 11. Uh, six wide yeah. receivers league, 11. you have Jalen Waddle, Amari Cooper, Terry McLaurin, which Go is fine. You. But I would like to bump those guys about two wide receiver slots down if I could. Yeah, I know. My reaction though is I like how you've structured this team in terms of having the studs. It's just your goal now is to fill out your depth because having, you know, Lamar Jackson, Jameer Gibbs, Mark Andrews as your main anchors at each of those respective positions. Jalen Waddle, while I would prefer him being by two, like he's a good start here. Um, I do wish uh, I, I knew if you had like an extra 2025 20, or something like that, but I, I'm guessing you don't because you don't have it listed here. I'm guessing you the, just have your 2025 20, picks, all of them. Maybe you sold yeah, them all. I, mean, have your in future case, picks. I would say your team's in worse position than I thought, but yeah. hopefully you have all your 2025 20, capital here and you just forgot to list it or whatever. I mean, you're kind of in, if you don't have your 2025 20, picks, you're kind of in a position now where your That's wide receiver issue. one or two yeah. on your team needs to come from your 109. Your wide receiver two yeah. or three on your team needs to come from your 111. You probably got to draft your RB3 at 202, your 306, <laughs> and your 410. You got to hit on Tank Dell and Puka Nakua well, from last year's class. The, like, you're in a position those, where you might have to hit on all your picks here. Those three rookie picks, you're just, you, uh, like, I, I don't care. Start 11, three wide receiver, three flex league. Like, you're pigeonholing it at wide receiver with these. Like, I, we don't say draft for need. But knowing this class, knowing the type of wide receiver profiles that'll be there on the one-two turn and knowing how you need them on this roster, especially from a youth injection standpoint, like, is it ideal knowing, hey, like, I'm going to be contending this year potentially and Jameer Gibbs, Joe Mixon, and nothing else is at running back? Not necessarily, but at the same time, I would feel more queasy about only having four receivers and three of them being ancient onto on this team to the point where I would rather get that youth injection and prepare early for the op, or the potential where oh D Hop is a shell of himself in season and he's only giving me you know nine PPR points per game because they added Malik Neighbors in the draft or oh Terry McLaurin you know I, who knows maybe with Jaden Daniels it's quarterback it's, it's probably going to be Jaden Daniels who's a rush first quarterback anyway right? yeah it's. It's a situation where you're not in a great spot where you basically have to hit on your rookie picks. I would yeah. be okay making a deviation if you say take Brian Thomas Jr. at 109, Xavier Worthy at 111, and Jonathan Brooks, who was RB1 in the class, or, or Benson. Trey Benson, who's RB2 in the class, is there at 202. I'd be okay making a deviation at running back because the wide receiver class is deep enough that you could take a shot on, say, Brendan Rice at 410, Malik Washington Tosh at 306, Washington at and hope you kind of sit on a, um, you know, a sleeper at wide receiver, and that's kind of, What's going to need to happen again? I hope you have your 2025 capital because you might need it in season to buy some production. But for me, this is kind of the type of team where you're young enough at other positions aside from running back and wide receiver that like you could probably stand to, you know, just see what happens as a house money team. But mid season, if we get to this thing and your rookie wide receivers aren't hitting yet and Amari Cooper and DeAndre Hopkins are still producing, but you're not quite a top team in your league. This is the type of team where mid-season I would sell Cooper, I would sell Hopkins, McLaurin, and Joe Mixon. Yeah, no, I, I pretty much agree with that analysis. Yeah, so this is definitely one of your typical wait-and-see type of approaches. We yep. can move on to the next team here, which is from Will Carter. 12-team PPR, four-point per passing touchdown, one quarterback league. Uh, Matt Stafford, Baker Mayfield, Justin Fields, Daniel Jones, not a very good quarterback core, but you do uh, you do have a very reminiscent running back core to uh, my old core and tone setter truthers, <laughs> Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Ramondre Stevenson, Puka Nakua, Nico Collins, DK Metcalf, Terry McLaurin, Jacoby Myers, Gabe Davis, and others at wide receiver. You also have Jake Ferguson, Pat Fryermuth at tight end in possession of the one quarterback, 103. So very valuable pick there, 203, 206, 208. 311, 411, and he do, does have all of his future picks by the looks of it. I'm assuming that means that's supposed to be 25 and 26. He's missing uh, his 25 and 26 seconds, and then his fourth, it looks like, in 26 as well. So 
Looking at the team, I mean, it's a pretty strong roster outside of quarterback. But the nice thing is you do have some buying power, I think, with those second rounders in a one quarterback league. I think you should be able to get up to a better guy. Oh, one quarter. Okay. I didn't see the context of the one quarterback. My apologies. I was going to say, like, could you get like a Kyler Murray type with this roster? But knowing now, I mean, with the twos, you might be able to. You don't even need to use the 103 for it. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. So, like, I was going to say that for a super flex, but in a one quarterback league, yeah, if you can. If you can get Kyler Murray for like the 203 or the 206 straight up right now, like I would absolutely do that in a heartbeat because I like Stafford uh, as a contending QB too that can spot in if you need him. Justin Fields obviously being your upside piece on the bench. Kyler Murray being as your main starter is honestly a really solid one one quarterback core to have. And unlike some teams that we've gone through, like this team has the luxury with Puka, Nico, DK, Terry McLaurin, you know, Jacoby Myers, Gabe Davis, a wide receiver with the running backs that you have with, you know, not spectacular, but I would say like a, a decent starting core at tight end there with Ferguson, Pat Frymouth. you got the opportunity now where if you can go and spend and get a quarterback, I think this team should be ready to compete year one. And like you said, uh, you've been the runner up for the past two seasons. And I really do feel like if you nail this rookie draft, let's just say the 103 nails your room with Dunze or the 103, if you end up moving i wouldn't probably package. take bowers i think i would just take odunze or neighbors whoever falls to you but uh I agree. yeah i mean nailing odun like to me the the guy that stands out to me is is potentially taking justin fields plus one of your second round picks and getting a better quarterback using fields as the upside alluring piece or whatever you maybe even yeah. do it with baker or daniel jones whatever one you want to do it with give them a quarterback back see if you can get 206 or 203 plus Baker Mayfield gets you Jordan Love or 203 plus Baker Mayfield gets you Anthony Richardson or Trevor Lawrence or somebody in that range. Yeah, no, I would agree. Like if you can get that type of quarterback to seal this whole thing together, you're pot potentially talking about a starting lineup now of Kyler Murray at the quarterback position, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley as your main two running backs, Puka Nakua, Nico Collins as your main two receivers, Ferguson as your tight end, and your two flexes being some combination of DK, Terry McLaurin, Ramondre, Jacoby Myers, uh, this upcoming season of full PPR league. Yeah, and uh, I think you could spend some of those twos on dart throw running backs in this year's class as well, yep. maybe some dart throw receivers. Again, we have a, a good set of values there in the one quarterback mid second round to the point that you could get an Xavier Leggett at 206. You could get a Blake Corum at 208 and that could really help fill out your roster as well. If you can hit big on some of those picks like last year's class, your Rasheed Rice's and Jaden Reed's of the world would definitely make some sense there. So, I mean, looking at some of his trades, he ended up selling off John U. Smith for the 206. Great process move there, obviously. Yeah. Tyquan Thornton, Daenerik Prince, two seconds and a third for Nico Collins and Michael Wilson. Yeah, just give me Nico Collins in that trade. And then Christian Watson for the 103. I mean, <laughs> Christian Watson leading into the season last year was definitely a valuable asset. And I'm assuming this person did not think that pick August was going to end up 103. They thought it was a mid to late first that they were giving up. But that aged like fine wine for you. I love that trade. So Christian Watson basically for Roma Dunes a straight up. Holy Christ. Yeah, you you fleece that guy. So again, he was assuming that was a late first. I guarantee it. And yeah. at the time, in a one quarterback league, a late first for Christian Watson, that was a pretty good buy by him. I think that was a smart he, move, but his team crumbled by the looks of it. I mean, he was a top 24 dynasty receiver. He was young. He was coming off a very efficient year. Like I had him. I'm pretty sure he was a fringe top 20 ranked receiver for me. So a one quarterback league, like late projected first is probably about the buying, the buying uh, cost that you would expect. So the fact that you're able to sell him and now that pick is the one Oh three. And like I said, I'm saying Roma Dunze, who knows? Maybe the guy at one Oh two in your league loves Roma Dunze. And that's Malik neighbors. Like you're guaranteed one of those stud receivers in this class. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are going to cut this video a little short at six teams because I do have to go to an appointment right now. So um, appreciate any of you guys who uh, submitted a team. Of course, we will be back with more episodes of Dynasty Decisions coming up with rookie drafts. I'm sure you guys want to know what your team situations are all like. So again, if you do want to submit a team for Dynasty Decisions, the link down below is in the description. Flock Fantasy subscribers using only promo code FSE do get to skip the line. So if you want to be on the next video, if you want to be on a video after the draft, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of submissions around that time of the year. Definitely check that out. Flock Fantasy has tons of other content, not just Dynasty Decisions Priority. Our rankings, Superflex, one quarterback, rookie rankings, draft guide, our prospect model coming out very soon as well. Tons of content over there, trade calculator, team submissions, all that good stuff. So if you guys are interested, hit the link down below for that. But with that being said, peace out, and we'll talk to you soon.